Good morning. We want to welcome everyone here, and we appreciate your presence. We do want to keep David in our prayers as he has continued to battle some health issues at this time, and we pray that the doctors will soon get to the bottom of it, and he'll soon be feeling better. You would be turning your Bibles this morning to the book of Amos, chapter 8. Amos chapter 8, we're going to look at verses 11 through 14 in that passage this morning. Amos 8, 11 through 14. And while you're turning there, I'll give you a little background. <clears throat> Around 750 B.C., an obscure farmer and shepherd was called by God to be a prophet. That man's name was Amos. His mission was to warn Israel of impending judgment from God if they did not repent. Sadly, we'll see that Israel did not heed that call to repent. And as a result of that, they were led into Assyrian captivity. Part of Amos' prophecy was fulfilled concerning an unusual famine that was to happen in the land. And there was a famine of the word of God. Now let's read Amos chapter 8, verses 11 through 14, and it will help us understand this more. We can read in Amos 8, beginning of verse 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to east. And they shall run to and fro, and seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. They that swear by the sin of Samaria and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth, in the manner of Beersheba liveth, even they shall fall and never rise up again. Those are some sad words that we can read here in this passage that the people refused to repent and turn from their sins and turn back to God and as a result, there was a famine for God's word. They didn't hear God's word. They weren't blessed with God's word as a result of it. Today we also have a famine in the land for the word of God. It's different in some ways, yet it's a little bit similar in other ways. And it produces similar results. So what I want to do this morning is I want to go back into the book of Amos. We're going to look at that passage or the book and various passages in Amos. And then we're going to make some modern day applications to us. We'll see what it did to them and how it affects us today. We do have a present day famine. Now I want to see first of all how it is different from what was in Amos day. The present day famine for the word of God was not sent by God. Contrary to that it's evident that God has provided us a feast with his word rather than a famine. I say that because you look in America we enjoy abundance of Bibles. I'm not even going to ask you how many Bibles you have at home because I know that all of us have more than one Bible at home. Some of us have multiple Bibles. And all through this country, there are people that have Bibles in their homes, but they never open it. They never read their Bible. Today's family of God's Word, as I said, was not sent by God as self-imposed. People have it readily available they simply choose not to open the Bible and read it and study it. Despite such access to the Bible, I believe the following little description I'm going to read you just in a moment illustrates the truth of this, and it is called the Diary of the Bible. We'll go through each month and see what the Bible, or how the Bible is often treated. January, now this is coming from the Bible itself, a busy time for me. Most of the family decided to read me through this year. They kept me busy for the first two weeks. I am now forgotten. February. My owner used me for a few minutes last week. He had an argument and was checking for references. March. Grandpa visited us. He kept me on his lap for an hour reading 1 Corinthians 13. April. I had a busy day. My owner was appointed to a leader of something and he used me. I got to go to church for the first time this year. It was Easter Sunday. May. I have a few grass stains on my pages. Had some early spring flowers pressed in me. 
June. I look like a scrapbook. They have stuffed me with full of clippings, and one of the girls got married. July. They put me in a suitcase today. I guess we're going off on a vacation. I wish I could stay home, as I will have to stay in this thing for a month. August. Still in the suitcase. September. Back in my old place. I have lots of company. The two, quote, true stories and four funny books were placed on top of me. I wish I could be read as much as they are. October. They use me a little today. One of them's sick. Right now I'm all shined up in the center of the table. I think the preacher's coming. November. Back in my old place. December. They're getting ready for Christmas. I'll be covered under wrapping paper and packages. That describes how a lot of Bibles are treated in this country and all over the world. But why is there such a famine for God's Word today? Well, as we go further, we can, we're going to be able to understand it even more. But then I'll notice some similarities. How is it similar to what they faced during Amos' day? The present-day famine is a result of similar causes, and we're going to look at some of these causes. The first one is material luxury. In Amos' day, this became a cause of pride which God hated. Over in Amos chapter 6, beginning of verse 1, we can read, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion, and trust in the mountains of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. Pass ye under Calna and see, and from thence go to Hamath the great, then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Be there, they better than these kingdoms? Or their border greater than your border? Ye that put far away the evil day and cause a seed of violence to come near, that lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall, that chant to the sound of the viol and invent to themselves music, instruments of music like David, that drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with chief ointments, but they're not grieved at the affliction of, day of Joseph. Therefore now shall they go, and go captive with the first that go captive, and the banquet of them that stretcheth themselves shall be removed. The Lord God hath sworn by himself, saith the Lord God of hosts, I abhor the excellency of Jacob and hate his palaces. Therefore will I deliver up the city with all that is therein. In Amos' day, there was the pride of luxury, and God didn't like their pride of luxury. Their luxuries had prompted them to put off the day of doom in their minds, which means they didn't want to think about what was going to happen in the future. They were told that they were going to be punished. They were told they'd be taken to captivity, and they did not take it seriously because they were enjoying their luxuries too much to even think about the future. God had warned Israel that it might cause some of them to forget God. And in Amos' day, we see that that happened. Likewise, Jesus warned that the riches could choke out those uh, who put their faith and trust in their riches rather than in God's Word. In Luke 8, 14, Jesus said, And that, that which fell among thorns are they, which when they heard, they go forth and are choked out by the cares, riches, and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. These are people who hear the word of God. They understand what they need to do, but they allow the things of this world to choke them out and turn them away from God's word. And he specifically says the cares, riches, and pleasures of this life. You look at the world today around us. How many people are more concerned with the cares of this life how much they can get from this life not planning for the future. And I'm not talking about retirement. We're talking about eternity. Those who are not thinking about anything but their riches or their pleasure. You look at the people you work with every day. Family members or even friends that you talk to. What do they have on their minds? What are they thinking about in this life? What they can get out of life? How much fun they can have? How much pleasure is in this life? Or are they thinking about going to heaven? majority of the people today are not really thinking about going to heaven. They're thinking about all the fun they're going to have. Today, many in their search for wealth 
have forgotten about God. Others are so filled with their time enjoying their luxuries they have no time for the Word of God. And thus it's similar to what they faced during Amos, Amos Day. But then the next thing we'll notice in the similarities is moral corruption. Just think about how corrupt the people had become in the days of Amos. In Amos 2, verses 6 and 7, we can read, Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sold the righteousness for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes, that pan after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor, and turn aside the way of the meek. A man and his father will go unto the same maid to profane my holy name. Look at what they were doing in their moral corruption. How immoral this world has, had become during their day. And look at it today. Look how immoral our world is. And what people have on their minds and what people are doing today that go totally against God's word. Who can even deny the, the effect that immorality is having on the church today? The world's standards have now become the standards of the church in so many places. Think about the dress, first of all. The dress of those people in the world. The Bible teaches us to dress modestly, and the world does just the opposite. Now what's happening in the church? It's sad to see the way people are dressing. What about the language that people use? Oh, it's commonplace now that, that people use bad language, so you're almost expected to use bad language if you don't something's wrong with you that's the way the world thinks and unfortunately that's crept into the church today now this happens when people will not want to feed upon the word of God if they did it would make them very uncomfortable because of its ability to reveal our true selves some people don't want to read the Word of God. They don't want to look at the Word of God because it condemns what they do. And so to soothe their own conscience, they just won't read the Bible. And that will make everything all right in their own minds. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, we can read, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What does it tell us here? That the Word of God, the Bible, is quick, is sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts, even the dividing spirit. It cuts and reveals people's own lives. It says it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. If you go back to Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, He reveals that, what is in the heart is what comes out. It's not always what is out of man that's defiling. It's what started in the heart. That defiles man. And people in their own hearts are defiled. And when they read God's word, then it hurts their conscience. They don't like that. So rather than turning from their sins and becoming a moral, faithful person, they just give up on God's word. So it's similar today in the famine that they had in Amos Day of the word of God. Because those people were doing the exact same thing. And what did God do? He punished them. What is God going to do for us today if we don't change? He's going to punish us. Look also at the religious corruption that was going on during Amos' day and you'll see the same thing today. The people of Israel could not wait for their religious days to be over. If you look in Amos chapter 8 verses 4 through 10, it says, Hear this. O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small, and the shekel great, falsifying the balances by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat, the Lord has sworn by the excellency of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall not the land tremble for this, and every one mourn that dwelleth therein? 
and it shall rise up holy as a flood, and it shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. And it shall come to pass that in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth on a clear day. And I will turn your feast into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. And I will bring up sackcloth upon the, all loins and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as the morning of an only son and the end, of, end thereof as a bitter day. God said, keep on doing what you're doing. And I'm going to get you. I'm going to punish you. And notice the description of the punishment was coming upon them. Why? Because they forgot about their religious days and their celebrations to God. They didn't care about that anymore. How many people will come and sit in an auditorium and say, well, I'm here. And they're there in body but not in spirit. Their mind's not into what they're, they should be into, and that's worshiping God. They're just there. Or those who have put it off altogether and say, why do I want to go? I'm just as good as those folks are. How many times have you talked to people and, and talked to them about their lives and about their standards they should have with God and reading and studying and obeying His Word? And they say, I'm just as good off as you folks are. I don't need to go to a church. I don't need to read my Bible. I'm just as good off as you are. It's not true. They think that in their own minds. Again, it's because they're deceiving themselves and are thinking they're okay kind of goes back to the I'm okay, you're okay philosophy that some people have. Don't worry about me, I'm all good. And they're going to find out when they draw their last breath and they wake up in torment and they're having to deal with that. And then the judgment of God when he says, depart from me all you workers of iniquity for I never knew you. They're going to realize then it was too late. The present day famine also produces similar results. As Amos described in a sad picture in verses 13 and 14, we read earlier, I want to read it again. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst, that they swear by the sin of Samaria, and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth, and the manner of Beersheba liveth. Even they shall fall and never rise up again. Notice young people were fainting from thirst, the thirst of the word of God. Others falling and not rising up again. Doesn't that describe the lives of many people today? Suffering from lack of spiritual food. They're easily overcome by temptation. Even common trials of life overwhelm them and they cannot deal with it. You look at what's happening in our country today with this pandemic we've been facing. You look at, at how it's affecting people's mental state today. I know in my line of work in law enforcement, we're seeing a lot more suicides, a lot more attempted suicides, and this time of the year you have a lot anyway. But with everything going on in 2020, things are getting even worse. People feel like they have no hope. Why do they have no hope? Because they do not have God. That's the big key to every bit of this, the only key to it. They do not have God in their lives. If they had God in their lives, they know there's a way out. They know there are things that can be done to help them. They know that God is going to bless them. God has promised to bless us. Now, he's not promised to give us a million dollars and make everything go away that's bad in our lives, but he's promised to take care of our daily needs if we follow him. He's promised to help us through this life, but if we don't live in this life, if we do pass in this life, whether it's from COVID-19, cancer, heart attack, or any other ailment that we might have, or a car accident, or whatever kills us. If we're faithful, we're going into that paradise of God to wait judgment, then to go to heaven when Jesus comes again. So either way, we win. Yet people have become so despondent and in so much despair because they don't have God and they don't know which way to turn. And that's why we see some of the bad things in this world today. Because people have turned away from God. There are two things necessary to resist the trials and temptations. First of all is faith in God. Paul wrote the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 and tells us that there is no temptation that has taken you but such as is common to man. 
But God is faithful who will not allow, allow you to be attempted above that which you are able. But will with that temptation also provide a way of escape. There's always an exit door to temptation. There's always an escape hatch to temptation. When temptation comes, he provides a way to get out of it. When the devil tries to turn us against God and, and entice us to do wrong, God always has a way out. But we have to take it. If you're in a burning building, let's say the front of the building, the back of the auditorium caught on fire, would you run through the flames hoping to get out, knowing that's the way of danger, or would you take one of these side doors? Vice versa, if it was burning up here, would you want to run up here, or would you go the opposite direction? God provides us a way of escape when temptation comes. Why do people run right into the fire rather than running away from it? It takes faith in God to have that way of escape. But then the second thing that's necessary to escape and resist trials is the fear of God. That is an awesome reverence that will motivate us to turn from evil. The Word of God is designed for both. Romans ten seventeen says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But we need to end the famine. And how do we do that? To end the famine, we must first appreciate the power of God's Word because it possesses the power of creation. In Hebrews eleven three, we can read, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. In other words... God spoke the world into existence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And notice verse 3, And God said, Let there be light. God said, God spoke it. His word spoke this world into existence. We have to realize and remember the power of creation. If God can do that, God can help us if we'll simply study His Word and obey it. We also have to appreciate the power of God's Word and the fact that it possesses the power of sanctification. Jesus, in His prayer in John 17, 17, said, Sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy Word is truth. In John 17, Jesus was praying to His Father, to God, just prior to his crucifixion. And he said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Do we believe that? The word brings sanctification. If we understand that God's word is truth, and we obey it. God's word also possesses the power of preservation. The young are instructed to keep their ways pure by it. Elders are exhorted to keep the church pure by it. Over in Psalm 119, verse 9, for the young, it says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. In Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 32, I'm not going to read that. But Paul is exhorting the Ephesian elders to stand firm because he says, Some of you are not going to, and he talks about what they're going to do. But he's telling them to be firm, be strong. Follow what they know is right. Follow God's word. The lack of knowledge, though, has always destroyed God's people. In Hosea 4, verse 6, it says, Thy people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. The Bible also possesses the power of salvation and condemnation. It can save our souls when it's properly received and applied. In James chapter 1, verse 21, it says, Wherefore, laying apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. If we receive with meekness God's word that's engrafted in our heart, it will save us. Those of you who may have fruit trees, if you have a limb that splits and it doesn't completely come off, maybe because it's heavy with fruit, maybe because of a storm, 
Some people will cut those off, but often they're grafted back in. They'll wrap that up and let that grow back so it produces more fruit. If we receive that engrafted word into our heart through obedience to the truth, then it saves our soul. It's also going to be the standard by which we will be judged one day. John chapter 12 and verse 48, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word, the same shall judge him in the last day. The words that I have spoken shall judge him in the last day. The words that Jesus has spoken, he said, they're going to judge us. So the word of God is going to be a standard of judgment. That is going to be the standard. That's the thing by which we will be judged. Shouldn't this motivate us to want to learn God's word? Shouldn't it motivate us to want to obey it and live like we should and neglect the foolishness of this world? But if we're going to have that happen, we must feed on it. As Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2 and verse 2, we need to be like babies longing for their mother's milk. 1 Peter 2, 2 says, As newborn babes desire that sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. That simple milk of the word. Babies start off on milk. And eventually, once they get some teeth and they can handle more food, they start getting into solid foods, handle something that they can digest and handle properly. But they start on simple things, basic things, the milk, and it helps them grow. When one is converted to Jesus Christ, he starts off on milk. A person that is, that is converted to Jesus Christ and is saved does not start off day one. I'm going to be the preacher of the church and the teacher of the church, and I'm going to do this. That You start off slow, and you gradually build it up. You've got to learn the basics and know what, what is expected of you and how to do things. And sometimes that takes a lot of time. Sometimes people learn it quicker. But it still takes time. We start off with the milk and then we grow. We need to be studying God's Word every day to receive the appropriate nourishment for our bodies spiritually, not bodies physically. I imagine most of you ate something this morning. I know some people skip breakfast. But most of you probably ate something. If you didn't, we'll be getting out of here pretty soon. You'll be eating something then. And then I imagine around 5, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, whatever time you normally eat your dinner, you'll be eating you something again. Because your stomach's going to start rumbling and growling telling you, put something in me. It's time to eat. Why don't we do that with the Bible? When we start dealing with things in this life, why don't we start looking when we're starving for God's Word why don't we go back to that rather than saying, yeah, I don't need that. I'll figure it out myself. Remember the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are those who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. When we hunger and thirst for physical food and we eat it, we're filled. We need to understand the same is true of the Word of God. When we get down into the Word of God and study it and obey it, we will be filled but it takes that constant feeding on the Word of God to remain healthy and strong spiritually. It must have been terrible for the Israelites to have been taken away as captives to a strange land, unable to feed upon the wonderful Word of God that has sustained them in the past. But how tragic it is today for people to self-impose a famine upon on themselves by turning away from God's word. By their own neglect, they're starving from spiritual malnutrition. They have spiritual malnutrition. They're starving as a result of it. By their own neglect, they remain captives to sin just as Israel was in Assyrian captivity. Their tragedy has increased when we realize that their neglect was not just one related to the word of God that existed in, in Amos' day, but they're neglecting the full and final revelation of God's Word given through Jesus Christ and His apostles to us today that we're forgetting about many times and starving because of the lack of feeding on it. As Paul told the Ephesian elders as he bid them farewell in Acts 20 verse 32, And so now, brethren, I commend you to God 
and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. May that be our prayer today that we will study God's word and live by God's word and never have a famine with it. Because we've got it. We've got Bibles. We need to read and study it. Could there come a time in our country like has happened in other countries in the past where the Bible was forbidden? Go to some of these Islamic nations. The Bible is outlawed there. The Quran is the only thing acceptable. And people who want to read and study the Bible are subject to punishment or death. Do you think we could get like that in this country? Absolutely. What are we going to do when that happens? We may just have to hide our Bibles, but we'll still read and study them. And if we're punished or we're put to death for reading the Bible, then so be it. We've done what God has required of us, not what man has required. And I pray that we won't have that, that famine, but that we'll continue to feast on God's Word so that we can be saved when this life is over. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, if you've never obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, then you have an opportunity today. Do you believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ is God's Son? John 8, 24 tells us if we don't believe, we're going to die in our sins. So it's imperative we believe in Jesus. We must change our lives in repentance. Luke 13, 3 says, I tell you, neighbor, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Turn away from sin and turn to God. Make the good confession that the eunuch made in Acts 8, verse 37 where he said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And upon that confession, just as that eunuch was in verse 38, baptized into Christ, you can be also for the remission of your sins. In Acts 2.38, those on Pentecost were told to repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you haven't done that, you have an opportunity today. Having done that, if you... If you have turned away from God and His Word and you're now in a famine rather than a feast, why not come back? Why not change your life today? Turn back to God through repentance, confession, and prayer. And God will once again forgive you in the second law of pardon and once again be back in the good graces of God, receiving the blessings of God. And prepare yourself for a home in heaven when this life is over. If you're subject in any way, come right now. Why together we stand and why we sing?